Dead America Gun Runners, Part 3 By Derek Slayton Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 51 The night air hung heavy and crisp around Private Wallace as he huddled beneath a thick sleeping bag, perched atop one of the trucks. His sniper rifle, equipped with a night vision scope, was trained down the highway, scanning the inky darkness for any hint of movement. Without the scope, the world dissolved into an abyss, shrouded in an eerie silence. There was no light pollution, only the faint moonbeams glinting off the safety reflectors scattered across the road. The group found itself 30 miles south of Riggins, Idaho, the only vestige of civilization in these desolate surroundings. Rocky hills and unforgiving terrain hemmed in the road, making it the only feasible route for vehicular approach. Although the wilderness harbored a potential threat from militias, the tiny community of less than 50 people they were nestled among provided a relatively safe cover. Venturing off-road in search of them would be akin to searching for a needle in a haystack. Wallace glanced at his watch, noting that less than an hour remained until sunrise. He couldn't help but shake his head, realizing they had lingered far too long. Originally, the plan had been to regroup for a couple of hours before hitting the road again, but they had now been here for nearly six. Is everybody sleeping in? Wallace quipped, lifting the radio to his lips. Alvarez, do you copy? He added, his voice tinged with disbelief. Sergeant Alvarez's voice crackled in response. I'm here, Wallace. Is everything okay? Well, we're still clear out here, Wallace replied but it's starting to feel like we're pressing our luck sitting in one place for this long. I know, Wallace, Alvarez conceded. We're going to be on the road before dawn. What's the holdup? Wallace inquired, his disapproval evident in his tone. It's Henderson, Alvarez explained. That temporary patch job wasn't holding, so we had to dig in and get a bullet fragment out of his shoulder. It took a lot out of him. Sarge. Wallace began, but Alvarez cut him off. Again, I understand Wallace, Alvarez said, and I know we're pushing it by staying here for this long, but he needed some rest. Copy that, Wallace replied. And speaking of, I'm going to need some of that rest as well. Been a long night, staring at nothing. I'll have you swap out with Robertson so you can catch a few hours rest in the cab once we hit the road, Alvarez assured him. Works for me, Wallace agreed. Just let me know when we're ready to move. You got it, Wallace. And if you see anything, let me know, Alvarez instructed. The line fell silent as Alvarez returned to studying the state map spread out in front of him. The soldiers had taken refuge in a small, old house located just off the highway. Alvarez glanced around the dimly lit living room where everyone was sprawled out a small kerosene heater providing much-needed warmth. His gaze lingered on Henderson, the injured soldier. While the shoulder wound wasn't fatal, the lack of proper medical attention could result in lasting damage to his arm. Alvarez forcibly pushed these thoughts aside, refocusing on the mission at hand. Delivering the ammunition to the military was their top priority, and any setbacks were unacceptable. Turning his attention to a small camping stove on the counter, Alvarez ignited the burner and set a pot of water atop it. As he turned around, Corporal Fisher, groggy from sleep, rose from a recliner and rubbed his eyes in an attempt to shake off the drowsiness. Alvarez gestured for him to come over. Coffee time already? Fisher inquired. I'm afraid all we have is hot tea, but it's better than nothing, Alvarez replied. As long as it's caffeinated, I can make it work. Fisher grinned. Fisher joined Alvarez in the kitchen, both of them studying the map. There was a circle marked just up the highway around the town of Riggins. Is this our next trouble spot? Fisher asked. It appears so, Alvarez replied. I've been staring at it for the last hour, worried. Well, walk me through it. Maybe I can help you feel better about it. Fisher offered. Okay, have a seat, Alvarez said. They both contemplated the map, and Alvarez began to explain. It doesn't look like the town is very wide. 
but it stretches on for a mile or so. To the east, there's a river, and to the west, rough mountainous terrain. So if there's any resistance, we're going to have to fight through it, Fisher observed. Exactly, Alvarez agreed. And there are plenty of opportunities for ambushes coming from the western hills. What's our plan then? Fisher inquired. We'll need to send a team up into the hills to make sure we're not being set up, Alvarez explained. Who do you have in mind? Fisher asked. I'm thinking Bradley and Leonard, Alvarez replied. They're both strong and can take out any threats quietly. I can go too, if you want, Fisher offered. I've been known to throw down in my time. Alvarez chuckled. Oh, I know. I've been out drinking with you, remember? Fisher grinned. What can I say? I was raised to believe that a bar brawl was a rite of passage. And just how many passages have you been through? Alvarez teased. Fisher chuckled. If I could count that high, I'd be a math teacher. After their brief laughter, they refocused on the task at hand. I'd prefer you to head up the trailing vehicle, Alvarez decided. If we do get hung up, they're more likely to come at us from the rear. So, I want a tail gunner and a shotgunner back there to give them a proper welcome. If anybody shows their face, I'll take them down, Fisher affirmed. As the tea kettle began to whistle, Alvarez allowed the sound to fill the small house for a moment before making an announcement. It's time for everyone to get up, he declared. Fisher, smirking, gathered an assortment of mugs from the cupboard. Alvarez addressed the room, rallying the groggy soldiers. Everybody up and at them, he called out. The soldiers and Cillian in the living room began to stir, sitting up and trying to shake off their fatigue. Alvarez removed the kettle from the stove and started pouring tea into the mugs. We have some breakfast tea. Get it while it's hot, then start packing up. We're moving in 20, Alvarez directed, preparing the team for the challenges that awaited them. The team eventually stirred, donning their gear and braving the biting cold as they ventured outside. The frigid air seemed to smack each of them in the face, leaving them momentarily stunned by its briskness. Private Wallace clambered down from the truck, draping his sniper rifle over his shoulder. Sergeant Alvarez handed him a cup of tea, which he gratefully accepted, using it to warm his hands before gulping it down. So, where am I at, Sarge? Wallace inquired. You're with Fisher and Hubbard in the rear vehicle, Alvarez replied. Rear vehicle, huh? So much for my nap, Wallace sighed. We have to get through a small town about 30 miles up the road, Alvarez explained. Once we get past that, we'll swap you out with the middle vehicle so you can get some rest. Yeah, fine. Just make sure to keep the gas pedal to the floor. Because whether we like it or not, I'm going to be unconscious in an hour, Wallace remarked with a wry smile. Corporal Fisher chimed in. Come on, Wallace. Let's get you situated. The soldiers gathered around their vehicles as Cillian approached. Alvarez, where do you want me with the truck? I can drive up ahead and scout it out, Cillian suggested. Alvarez shook his head, declining the offer. Stick with us and fall in behind the lead vehicle. Once we get past Riggins, I'll send you ahead. Cillian nodded and hurried over to his truck, revving the engine to speed up the heating process. Alvarez climbed into the first vehicle, with Henderson in the front seat and Bradley in the back. Acosta, Robertson, and Leonard occupied the middle truck, while Fisher, Wallace, and Hubbard brought up the rear. Alvarez picked up the radio and addressed the team. Okay, everybody, day two of this road trip. It's a short drive to Riggins. You all know what to do, so let's do it. He tossed the radio onto the seat beside him and kicked the truck into gear, leading them out from the house. It took a moment to navigate the tiny community before reaching the highway. Once on the road, they wasted no time in gaining speed. As they drove, the sun began to peak above the horizon, casting a warm, reddish glow on the clouds above. The sky was painted in shades of red and orange, creating a breathtaking morning scene. If they weren't constantly vigilant for potential threats, 
it would have been a wonderful start to the day. After about half an hour, the dreaded sign appeared. Riggins, one mile. Alvarez slowed down, eventually stopping the convoy in the middle of the road. He grabbed the radio again. Okay, Bradley Leonard, you're up. Alvarez directed. Stay on the radio and keep us updated. If everything goes smoothly, we'll pick you up on the other side of town. Bradley and Leonard promptly opened the back doors of their trucks, hopped out, and shut the doors behind them. They darted off the road with their rifles slung over their shoulders. Once off the road, they faced a steep climb to the top of the rocky terrain, ascending a hundred yards to reach the main peak. The group watched from the trucks as they reached the summit, conducting a quick survey before reporting in. We're up top, beginning our search, Private Bradley relayed. Happy hunting, boys, Alvarez replied. Alvarez gave them a few minutes to get situated, observing as they moved along the ridge before disappearing from view. He put the truck back into gear, resuming their cautious drive. Henderson, keep an eye across the river. Let me know if you see anything, Alvarez instructed. Henderson, despite his injury, took his position more upright in his seat, scanning the surroundings. The convoy continued forward, driving slowly, and remaining vigilant. Eventually, they rounded the last corner before reaching the town. When they did, Alvarez slammed on the brakes, staring ahead in disbelief. Sarge, what is it? Acosta asked. Everybody pull up beside me. Heads on a swivel. Alvarez ordered. The other two trucks pulled up beside Alvarez, and they all looked towards the town. Blocking the road ahead were two rows of cars, with a couple of dozen zombies attached to them by chains. These creatures roamed aimlessly, their movements restricted by the six-foot chains around their necks. A few of them noticed the approaching convoy and reached out towards it. What do we do now, Sarge? Henderson asked. We have to clear it. Alvarez replied grimly, and hope that whoever set this up isn't here waiting for us. Chapter 2 The convoy came to a halt in the middle of the road, just short of the town. The drivers kept their feet on the pedals, ready for any potential ambush. Ahead of them lay a barricade composed of a dozen cars, each bearing a grim cargo of zombies. Over the radio, Private Acosta's voice broke the silence. How do we handle this, Alvarez? Sergeant Alvarez sat in contemplation, fully aware of the many risks they faced. The cars ahead were likely booby-trapped, and an ambush loomed as a constant threat. Leonard, Bradley, status report. Alvarez finally responded. Private Bradley replied, We've encountered zero resistance so far. It doesn't even look like anybody has been here in weeks. Do you have eyes on the town? Alvarez inquired. Just about. Hang on, Bradley replied, taking a moment to assess the situation. Cillian, eager to contribute, offered, Alvarez, I can scout ahead. Stand down, Cillian. We need more information first, Alvarez ordered. Moments later, Bradley's voice returned over the radio. We have a good vantage point on the town, and it's not good. We can see the zombie barricade, Alvarez acknowledged. That's the least of your worries, Sarge. Beyond that, there are another hundred of those things loose in the streets. But it's strange, Bradley reported. Alvarez's interest was piqued. How so? It's like they're not just scattered about. They're in packs around certain buildings. As if there's something inside keeping their attention, Bradley explained. It could be other zombies. We've seen that before, Alvarez mused. Bradley disagreed. Not like this. There are way more than usual trying to get inside. Sergeant Alvarez surveyed the scene and noted dozens of zombies pressed against a trio of buildings throughout the town. Do you think it's an ambush? He asked Bradley. If it is, they didn't plan it well. There are so many of those things that you could drive by and the people inside wouldn't even see you, Bradley concluded. Okay, I want you to push forward. It'll take us a minute to clear this obstacle. 
I'll make contact before we move, Alvarez ordered. Do you need us to watch the other side of the river? Bradley inquired. Negative. Wallace can handle that. We have a good vantage point from here, Alvarez assured. Copy that, Bradley acknowledged. Wallace, do you copy? Alvarez asked. Order heard. Getting in position, but I'd really appreciate it if someone could cover my back, Wallace requested. Corporal Fisher volunteered. I got it, Sarge. Okay, Robertson. Cillian. On me, Alvarez directed. As Alvarez climbed out of the cab, Henderson slid into the driver's seat. Alvarez felt a sense of unease, but Henderson gave him an affirming nod. Don't worry, Alvarez. I can hit the gas and get us to cover if needed, Henderson reassured. Alvarez nodded and walked to the front of the vehicle, with Cillian and Robertson following suit. Together, they surveyed the situation, all three sharing a collective sigh. Well, day two is off to a hell of a start, Private Robertson remarked. Alvarez turned to his comrades. Were you two on the radio to hear the situation in town? Both men confirmed, and Alvarez continued. Okay, obviously, we need to clear this out. But we need to know what's going on in town. I want the two of you to get into town and... Cillian raised his hand, interrupting Alvarez. Yes, Cillian, Alvarez inquired. Cillian explained, with all due respect to Robertson here, if you want me to scout out the town, you should let me do it on my own. No offense, Robertson. Robertson responded, I mean, I'm a little offended, but go ahead. Tell us why. Cillian continued, I know how to get those things moving, wherever I want them to. Robertson or anyone else will just get in the way. I can handle it, Sergeant. Alvarez voiced his concern. And what if there are militia hiding in town? Cillian countered, They're going to be a lot less likely to give away their positions for the likes of me. If they see one of you guys, they might be willing to risk it. After a brief exchange of glances between Robertson and Alvarez, the sergeant made his decision. Okay, it's your show, Cillian. It makes my life easier with Robertson here. Do you have your radio? Alvarez inquired. Cillian held up his radio and nodded. All right, we're going to clear you a path on the right side of that barricade. You get in. See what you can see, and get back to us, Alvarez ordered. Cillian acknowledged, you got it, Sergeant. Before they moved, Alvarez contacted Wallace over the radio. Wallace, do you see anything on the other side of the river? Private Wallace replied, I have some deer running around, but nothing hostile. Keep your eyes peeled. We're moving up towards the barricade, Alvarez instructed. Copy that, Wallace responded. The three of them approached the barricade from their trucks. Alvarez and Robertson readied their rifles while Cillian reached into his bag, ensuring his knife was accessible and a couple of cell phones were powered on. As they advanced to within 15 yards of the barricade, the zombies began to react, reaching out, moaning, and gnashing their teeth. However, the chains around their necks prevented them from making any progress. The two soldiers raised their rifles and took aim at the zombies at the back of the car on the far right side, pulling the triggers and dropping four of them. The trio continued to inch forward, testing the limits of the chain leashes that bound the creatures. There was a half-car length of space between the last zombie and the back of the car. They fired again, this time targeting the second row of cars, which was another 15 yards back. In a matter of moments, they had cleared a path. You're up, Cillian. Be careful and observe only, Alvarez cautioned. Cillian nodded confidently. I'll be in touch. Cillian carefully hopped over the first car of the barricade, his eyes scanning the narrow passage between the twin barricades of cars, ensuring that no danger approached. While he remained safe for the moment, the sight of dozens of leashed zombies was unnerving. His thoughts wandered as he advanced to the second part of the barricade. Why in the world would someone do this? Cillian wondered aloud. Shaking off his thoughts, 
Cillian climbed over the second barricade and steadied himself as he surveyed the area. The highway stretched ahead, twisting and turning through the town. Oddly, there were no zombies on the road itself, which struck him as peculiar. Okay, let's get in there, Cillian muttered to himself. He broke to his right, jogging down to the far edge of the town, which abruptly ended just before the river. Upon reaching the railing, he glanced down and noticed that the river was relatively low. Cillian then turned northward, moving up a few blocks, cautiously checking every window along the way for any signs of ambush. Despite his vigilance, he found only empty buildings. Cillian proceeded three blocks further before he heard moaning and observed a handful of creatures banging their hands forcefully against windows. He reached the corner of a building, peering down the street for a block and realizing that a large mob of creatures had gathered in front of a building. Taking stock of his surroundings, he noted that he was only a block away from the highway. As he studied the targeted building, he realized it lacked a direct line of sight to the highway, even from the rooftop as it was shorter than the adjacent building. This doesn't make any sense, Cillian muttered to himself. His scrutiny revealed that the back of the building remained free of zombies, and the back door hung open. Strangely, every creature was fixated on the front. That makes even less sense. If someone was alive in there, they surely would have fled by now, or at least been smart enough to stay away from the windows. Those things should have wandered away by now, Cillian pondered. After a moment of consideration, he nodded to himself, determined to investigate further. I need to see what's in that building, Cillian resolved. Cillian retraced his steps by one block, ascending parallel to the targeted building. He surveyed the mob, ensuring they were not looking in his direction. Breaking cover, he moved swiftly and silently toward the back of the building, taking cover as soon as he could to conceal his movements. Finally, he reached the back door, readying his knife as he slipped inside. With gentle care, Cillian closed the door, cautious not to make any noise. He found himself in the back room of a small store, enveloped in darkness. He allowed his eyes a few moments to adjust before advancing further. As he stood there, he heard music emanating from the front of the building. What the hell is that? Cillian muttered, perplexed by the unexpected sound. Although confused, he compelled himself to continue. He reached the door leading to the main part of the store and pulled back the curtain, observing no movement, at least not within the store itself. Outside, however, dozens of ghouls pressed against the glass, fervently trying to gain entry. Convinced that he was alone inside the building, Cillian ventured into the main showroom, where the music became markedly louder. Approaching the source of the music, a large battery-operated boombox. He wondered aloud, what the hell? Cillian moved closer to inspect the compact disc, which was set to play on repeat. He almost switched it off, but hesitated. Wait, this doesn't make any sense. If this is playing, those things are off the main road. But if I turn it off, they're going to scatter. But if someone was trying to ambush us, then why would they have this playing? Cillian pondered aloud. He stepped away from the boombox and retreated to the back room, where the environment was quieter. Retrieving his radio, he attempted to contact Sergeant Alvarez. Sergeant Alvarez, do you copy? Cillian spoke into the radio. Sergeant Alvarez responded, We're just about clear up here, Cillian. Give me some good news. Cillian hesitated. I don't know if I have any yet. What do you have for me? Sergeant Alvarez inquired. Just confusion. I found what was attracting the zombies to the buildings. Someone set up a distraction to hold them in place just off the highway, Cillian reported. Well, if they're off the highway, then that's good for us, Alvarez remarked. Maybe. Can you give me a little more time to investigate? Something just feels off, Cillian requested. Make it quick. I don't want to stay stationary any longer than I absolutely need to, Alvarez replied. I'll be in touch, Cillian acknowledged before pocketing the radio and exiting the building. 
he moved northward a few blocks, stopping to gaze across the highway at the next cluster of zombies congregating around another building. Spotting a sturdy light post nearby, Cillian hopped onto it and pulled out his binoculars, peering into the window of the building. While the view was challenging, he managed to spot another boombox placed atop a display. As he attempted to piece together the puzzle, the radio suddenly sprang to life. Have you found any threats? Alvarez asked. No, just the zombies listening to music just off the highway, Cillian replied. Okay, we're going to risk it. I have somebody driving your truck, so hop into the back when we drive by, Alvarez instructed. Sergeant, I, Cillian began. I know you have concerns, but we need to move, Alvarez interrupted. With the radio conversation concluded, Cillian stood there, feeling a sense of frustration. While he pondered the situation, he looked across the road at one of the store overhangs, where a large loudspeaker was aimed at the ground. Confused, he ventured closer to the street, examining several more loudspeakers placed similarly, with hastily run wires connecting them. That's not right. That's, Cillian began, but before he could comprehend the implications, the loudspeakers blared to life. The deafening sound forced him to cover his ears as the pain became unbearable. He managed to regain his composure enough to glance across the highway. The zombies that had been attracted to the music now had a new fixation, the blaring siren. Cillian realized that within seconds, the highway would be swarmed with zombies. Oh, dear God, he whispered in dismay. Chapter 3 The sirens blared relentlessly, rattling the glass of the giant store windows. Cillian stood at the edge of town, peering down the highway, which stretched for half a mile. There was no sign of the convoy he had been expecting. Sergeant! Sergeant! Cillian called out urgently, trying to get Sergeant Alvarez's attention over the deafening noise. The cacophony made it nearly impossible to hear any response, even if there was one. Cillian's gaze shifted across the street, where he noticed a horde of zombies emerging from the next block, slowly making their way onto the highway. Shit, he muttered, his mind racing. Cillian weighed his options, initially considering taking refuge in one of the nearby stores. However, the thought of being trapped inside quickly dissuaded him. Instead, he sprinted back toward the river, making the first turn for cover. Think, man. Think, he muttered to himself, casting a glance eastward and spotting a line of houses on the last row. He sprinted toward one, reaching the front door, and entered cautiously, knife in hand. Even inside the house, the blaring sirens remained deafening, making it difficult for Cillian to discern any potential threats. He moved swiftly through the house, his grip tight on the knife, searching for signs of danger. To his relief, he found himself alone. Cillian located an interior closet, opened it, and slipped inside, shutting the door behind him. He pulled out a radio, desperately attempting to establish contact. Sergeant Alvarez, can you hear me? He pleaded, the radio crackling to life amidst the piercing siren. Alvarez's voice came through, distorted by the noise. What the hell is that, Cillian? Cillian explained. There are speakers on the buildings along the highway. Something triggered them to lure those things onto the road. You need to disable them. Alvarez's voice was tense. We're stuck in the middle of town. Spike strips on the road, and those things are closing in. Cillian expressed his frustration. I'm sorry, Alvarez. I didn't catch the spike strips. Alvarez continued. Not your fault. But we're going to need help if we're getting out of this. Cillian inquired. Can you take out the sirens? Alvarez replied. Yeah, I can see a couple of them from here. Take them out, Cillian instructed. I can draw those things away from you. Alvarez agreed, and both he and Henderson readied their weapons. As they fired rounds at the speakers, the projectiles ricocheted off, but eventually they managed to disable the devices. Despite their success, 
The blaring of sirens persisted further into town. However, the creatures near the trucks remained fixated on the soldiers, the distant sound not enticing enough compared to the promise of fresh meat in front of them. Alvarez communicated with his team. Leonard Bradley, we're in a tough spot here. Do you have anything? Private Leonard replied, negative, Sarge. There's nobody up here. Alvarez ordered them, keep moving to the far end of town. I need a full survey of the land. Copy that. Cillian, you're up, Alvarez barked. Cillian emerged from the closet and cautiously approached the front door. He peered outside, spotting a couple of zombies who had strayed from the pack, gripping his knife tightly. He stepped out, and one of the zombies began shambling toward him. Rather than engage, Cillian sprinted away, leaving the pursuing zombie behind. He moved quickly toward the convoy, retrieving a cell phone from his bag. Cillian reached the road just before the highway and dashed toward the convoy, his eyes scanning for spikes or traps. There were none in sight. It took him a few minutes to reach his destination. He positioned himself behind the building closest to the highway, observing the horde pressing against the trucks. Okay, Sergeant, I'm on your position, Cillian reported. Where are the spike strips? Alvarez responded, about 10 yards ahead of us. It's hard to see right now with those things all over it. Cillian responded, I'm going to lure them away from you. I might not get all of them, but I can thin their numbers enough for you to reach the spike strip. Alvarez acknowledged, I can work with that. Leonard said he doesn't see any more spike strips, just this one. Cillian declared, it doesn't matter. Once you clear this trap, take the next right and head to the north side of town on the side road. I've already cleared it, at least halfway. Good man, Alvarez praised. Cillian concluded, I don't know who set these traps, but they're here. We might as well use them to our advantage. Alvarez agreed. Damn straight. Now, once you pull them away, haul ass toward the center of town. We'll pick you up. Cillian prepared for his part, placing the radio in his bag and taking out two cell phones. He turned the volume up to the max and scrolled through the songs, selecting the loudest heavy metal tracks he could find on each phone. As the screeching guitars and thunderous drums blared from the speakers, Cillian shouted, Yeah, come on, I'm over here! The nearby zombies couldn't resist the noise, their attention now focused on him. Dozens of them broke away from the convoy, shuffling towards Cillian. He noticed a few on the far side of the trucks that remained uninterested, so he whistled loudly. Hey, you in the back, let's move it. The piercing whistle had drawn the attention of some creatures, but not all of them. Cillian realized that he needed to try again, but the zombies pursuing him were getting dangerously close. Glancing up at the truck, he made eye contact with Henderson. He shrugged at the soldier before beginning to backpedal, creating distance between himself and the approaching undead. Cillian continued to hold the blaring cell phones up high, making as much noise as possible to lure the creatures away from the highway. Henderson kept a watchful eye on him as he reached the final street on the block and turned north. He's away, Henderson said. How am I looking over there? Alvarez asked. Henderson peered out the window, spotting several zombies on the final two transport trucks with a significant gap between them. There's a good 15 yards between you and the closest zombie. You might want to act quickly, Henderson replied. Alvarez checked his side mirror, spotting a couple of zombies just down from his door. Looking out the window, he saw several more at the front of the truck. Let's swap spots, Alvarez suggested. It's going to be easier for me to get out that way. The two men switched seats, settling into their new positions. Alvarez picked up the radio again. Okay, listen up, he addressed the team. We're about to get moving. When you see me outside the truck, make as much noise as you can to keep those things close to you. Once we're moving, we're taking the first right and heading north. Be ready to go on my signal. Alvarez put the radio down and turned to Henderson, who was now in the driver's seat. 
As soon as that spike strip is out of the way, you floor it. I'll jump on or chase you until I catch up. Just get to that turn and off the highway as fast as you can. Alvarez instructed. Henderson nodded in acknowledgement. Alvarez pulled out his handgun, checked the magazine, and placed his hand on the door handle. He opened the door and quickly jumped out, closing it gently behind him. Alvarez moved toward the front of the truck, and as he did, a zombie appeared, alerted by the sound of his boots hitting the ground. Without hesitation, Alvarez squeezed the trigger, sending a round through the creature's head and dropping it to the ground. He then darted out from the side of the truck, running toward the silver metal spike strip that lay across the road. As he approached, he noticed several zombies shambling toward him. Raising his gun, he fired precise shots, dropping several of them in the middle of the road. With a bit of breathing room, Alvarez grabbed one side of the spike strip and ran across the highway, dragging it with him. The weight of the barrier quickly became a burden, but he powered through it while keeping a vigilant eye on the approaching zombies. Meanwhile, Henderson started up the truck and accelerated. The entire convoy gained speed as Alvarez dropped the spikes behind him. Sprinting back across the street, Alvarez stayed in front of the truck as it plowed through a couple of creatures. He leaped onto the passenger side foothold, gripping what remained of the side mirror. Henderson strained as he turned the truck down the next street and onto the side road off the highway. Alvarez climbed into the cab, getting situated. Are you good, Henderson? Alvarez asked. Yeah, hanging in there. I got a couple more turns in me, Henderson replied, determination in his voice. As they reached the center of town, Cillian appeared on the side of the road, waving them down. He climbed into the passenger seat of his truck. We're just about out of here, Alvarez said with relief. But then, the radio crackled to life once more, causing Alvarez to curse under his breath. Damn it, might have spoken too soon, Alvarez muttered. Sarge, we have a problem, Bradley said over the radio. What is it, Bradley? Alvarez inquired, his frustration growing. Alvarez signaled Henderson to stop the truck and the vehicle came to a halt a few blocks away from the congregation of zombies. There's another barricade on the road out of town, Private Bradley reported. We moved the first one. We can move this one too, Alvarez replied confidently. But Bradley's response was disheartening. I don't think so, Sarge. They're not cars. They're those concrete barriers. And the truck that was carrying them. Damn thing is jackknifed. It would take us a week to do it by hand. Alvarez's frustration deepened. Damn it. Okay, listen. I want you and Leonard to find a firing position overlooking it. We've got to figure something out. Copy that, Bradley acknowledged. The radio went silent, and Alvarez turned to Henderson with a heavy sigh. Hang a right and get us as far away from the highway as you can, Alvarez instructed. We have a serious problem. Chapter 4 Cillian stood vigil at the corner of the house, his gaze fixated on the distant street where he had led the pursuing mob away from their convoy. Private Wallace maintained his post atop the truck, his sniper rifle aimed across the river. Meanwhile, the rest of the soldiers stood outside the convoy, uncertainty hanging heavy in the air. Corporal Fisher voiced the question that weighed on everyone's mind. What in the hell do we do now? There's no way we can move that stuff. Private Hubbard pondered aloud. I'm guessing we can't drive around it. Sergeant Alvarez shook his head, his concern evident. Even with the river as low as it is, it's too big a risk of getting stuck. Private Acosta suggested we can always blow our way through it. But the group reacted with reluctance, clearly not thrilled by the idea. Sergeant Alvarez voiced his reservations. Do we even have enough plastic explosive to do it? Private Hubbard replied, probably. Depending on the layout, we should be able to take out enough of it for us to squeeze through. Private Robertson questioned even the truck. Hubbard nodded, determination in his eyes. It'll take a minute to set up. But yeah, I can blow that truck in half if I use enough of this stuff. Alvarez was bothered, torn by the difficult decision ahead. 
I don't like it. If we do this, are we going to have enough to rig the trucks if we need to? Private Hubbard admitted, I'll do my best to use as little as possible, but realistically, it's going to take most, if not all of it. Frustration welled up in Alvarez as he stepped away from the group momentarily, shaking his head and letting out a grunt before returning. Okay, get what you need, Hubbard. Corporal Fisher, still wrestling with the gravity of their situation, said, Sarge. Alvarez interrupted. Fisher, if you have a better idea, I'm all for it. But I don't see any other option. Fisher conceded. Yeah, I know. I don't either. But it's just... Their words trailed off, both knowing that this course of action seemed almost too convenient for their adversaries. Alvarez expressed his unease. It's just like these assholes knew we were going to rig the trucks. So they wanted to force us to use it. Yes, it does feel like that. Fisher agreed. I mean, it explains why they haven't ambushed us here. Doesn't do them much good if they take us out only to have their prize go up in flames. Despite the plan, Alvarez reminded everyone. Still, I want vigilance out there. There's still every possibility that they're going to come for us. The group nodded, aware of the impending danger. Suddenly, music began playing from Cillian, who glanced back at the group. Cillian reported, there's about a dozen of them coming our way. I'm going to get them going in the other direction. Alvarez instructed, do it, then get back to your truck. Because as soon as we set this off, we're going to have to move. Cillian nodded and disappeared around the side of the house, the music fading as he moved further away. Alvarez refocused the group. Robertson, you're on me. Fisher, Acosta, Henderson, back behind the wheel. I'll have Leonard and Bradley ready to meet us just past the wreckage. When you see that go off, you haul ass towards us. The soldiers nodded in agreement as Hubbard returned with a bag of C4 explosives and a handful of detonators. Robertson and Alvarez held their rifles at the ready as they headed towards the blockade. The three soldiers jogged, their bodies still aching from the long drive and the previous day's fight, but they knew time was of the essence. As they got within a block of the town's edge, they could see the wreckage. The large flatbed transport truck lay on its side, its front cab slammed into a wall. Concrete barriers were strewn about, creating a formidable obstacle. The greatest challenge, however, was the mob of ghouls, just a block ahead of them, close to the town's edge. Though they could easily sprint past, they understood that setting up explosives would take time, and the last thing they wanted was zombies closing in. Alvarez handed Hubbard a pair of binoculars, asking, Tell me what you think. How much time do you need? Hubbard studied the situation for a moment before responding. Shouldn't take me longer than five minutes if we go up the middle, but I don't think we should go that route. Alvarez inquired, which way do you want to go? Hubbard suggested, I say we go to the east. There are fewer barriers in the way, so what little explosives we have will be more effective. Alvarez raised another concern. What about the truck? Those axles are going to be stronger than the middle of the truck, aren't they? Hubbard explained they will be, and that's my plan. The truck isn't blocking all the way across. There's already a few yards of clearance between it and the drop-off to the river. This stuff packs a hell of a punch. We just need it to kick that truck back a few yards, and we're good to go. After a moment of hesitation, Alvarez nodded. Okay, Hubbard. I trust you. You get it set up, and we'll cover you. Hubbard nodded back and the three soldiers broke cover. Hubbard sprinted ahead while Alvarez and Robertson moved more cautiously, keeping their guns trained on the zombie horde. They managed to get 10 yards past the ghouls before a couple of them noticed and started to approach. Alvarez took aim and fired, a shot that resulted in one ghoul's head exploding. Robertson did the same, but unintentionally hit a different zombie when the bullet went straight through his target causing it to turn and attract others from the horde. The two men stood their ground, 
ready to fend off the approaching ghouls. Alvarez remarked, a hint of sarcasm in his voice. Nice shooting. Robertson replied confidently, Hey, I dropped him, didn't I? Amid the chaos, Alvarez and Robertson continued to fire at the advancing horde of ghouls. The staccato rhythm of gunshots echoed through the air as they carefully backed up, maintaining a safe distance of 20 yards. Their retreat led them back to the wreckage, where Hubbard signaled them with a thumbs up. Alvarez gave Robertson a friendly pat on the shoulder, gesturing for him to follow. They joined Hubbard, who had the detonator in hand, ready to bring their explosive plan to life. Hubbard recommended, I suggest we put some distance between us and the truck before we hit the trigger. Alvarez agreed. Let's get up to around the bend past it. Give these things a minute to catch up. Might as well kill two birds with one stone, right? The three men quickly sprinted up the highway, putting several hundred yards between themselves and the impending explosion. Once they reached the bend, Alvarez grabbed the radio. Alvarez conveyed, we're about to blow this thing. Just stay to the right on the road and watch the riverbank drop off. We're up around the next bend. Private Bradley responded, We're just above you, Sarge. We'll be right down. The rest of you, get ready to roll, Alvarez instructed. Private Acosta acknowledged, Copy that, Sarge. With Hubbard in control, the detonator switch clicked on, and he pressed the button. A deafening blast erupted, tearing through the air causing ripples in the water as the shockwave hit the river. Alvarez, his ears ringing, peeked out from behind cover, seeing the devastation. Good job, Hubbard. Really good job. Hubbard and the others cautiously emerged, witnessing the aftermath of the explosion. The entire back end of the truck had been obliterated, sliding 30 yards down the highway with one tire still ablaze. They waited for the convoy to arrive and then took a moment to regroup. Everyone returned to their designated vehicles. Before Wallace climbed into the back of his truck, Hubbard had a suggestion. Hey, Wallace. Sarge said you needed to catch some shut-eye. I can keep the rear watch for a couple of hours. I appreciate that, Wallace replied. The two soldiers shared a fist bump before securing themselves in their respective vehicles. Once they were ready, Fisher honked the horn, signaling the convoy that they were prepared to move. Alvarez sighed with relief as they made it through Riggins, but the unease still lingered. Private Henderson noticed Alvarez's expression. What is it, Sarge? Alvarez responded. It's nothing, Henderson. Just relieved to be out of that, and just wondering what they're going to throw at us next. Henderson shrugged as they both focused on the road ahead. They were approaching a bridge over the river. As they crossed it, Henderson noticed a sign. Private Henderson remarked, Hey, look, Sarge. We're crossing over into the Pacific time zone. Guess that means we're getting closer to home. Alvarez chuckled. We just went back an hour. Looks like we get to bill Uncle Sam a little extra today. As they laughed, they reached the midpoint of the bridge. And that's when they heard it. Small detonations, one after the other, reverberated under them. The bridge ahead began to crumble, and they could feel it giving way beneath their trucks. Alvarez exclaimed, Holy shit! Alvarez floored the gas pedal, struggling to keep the truck steady on the disintegrating bridge. Large chunks of the structure fell into the shallow water below. The lead vehicle became partially airborne as they hit the edge of the bridge landing hard on the road on the other side. They kept driving, Alvarez checking the rearview mirror. Cillian in his pickup truck and Acosta in her vehicle had safely crossed, but Fisher was stranded in the middle of the collapsing bridge. The back wheel was caught in a hole, and Fisher was frantically flooring the gas pedal to no avail. Alvarez desperately called out, Fisher, get out of there, man! Alvarez watched helplessly as the bridge gave way beneath Fisher's truck. Miraculously, the vehicle landed upright, but with a violent impact. Alvarez started to exit his truck, but bullets struck around him, forcing him to stay inside. Horns honked behind him as enemy vehicles emerged from cover near the river. 
Alvarez grimly muttered, Damn it. Knowing they had no choice but to drive on, Alvarez accelerated. He also had faith that Fisher, as tough as they come, could handle himself. The two transport trucks and the pickup sped away up the highway, gaining precious seconds before the pursuing enemy vehicles hit the road. Chapter 5 Fisher and Wallace found themselves in a state of shock as they struggled to regain their senses. The violent collision had left their bodies aching and their minds rattled from the impact. The front windshield of the truck lay shattered, and everything inside the cab had been thrown into chaos. It took them a moment to gather themselves, reaching for their weapons as they did so. What in the holy hell was that? Private Wallace exclaimed, his voice trembling with uncertainty. I think the other shoe just dropped, Corporal Fisher replied grimly, his eyes scanning their surroundings. Suddenly, the air was filled with the deafening sound of bullets striking the side of the truck, causing both men to startle. And now they're shooting at us, Wallace said, his voice tense. Fisher's gaze darted around, searching for the radio, but he quickly realized it was broken and tossed it aside. We gotta move, he urged urgently. Wallace, still visibly shaken, asked, What about Hubbard? Fisher winced, a momentary hesitation in his eyes before he smacked his hand on the back of the truck. However, there was no reply. Either he's unconscious or he's gone, Fisher said with a heavy sigh. In either case, we can't do anything about it right now. We have to move. Wallace, though upset, switched into battle mode. He peered out of the side window, spotting half a dozen armed men approaching from the river, along with two pickup trucks heading for the highway. I got six over here, Wallace exclaimed. With bullets narrowly missing them, Wallace drew his handgun and returned fire, though it was challenging to get a solid aim at the distant militia. Meanwhile, Fisher glanced out of his side window and noticed movement in the hilly area on the other side of the river. Muzzle flashes were followed by bullets, striking the truck. Let's get to the hills, Fisher urged. Wallace, still firing his handgun, asked, Is it clear? Fisher replied, Nope, but I have a huge chunk of bridge over here to hide behind. Good enough for me, Wallace said, determination in his voice. The two men quickly exited through the driver's side door, bullets flying dangerously close to them. They waded through the shallow river and reached a piece of fallen bridge jutting several feet above the water, supported by a beam. Wallace readied his sniper rifle, checking the scope and breathing a sigh of relief as it remained intact. He kissed it briefly in gratitude. Okay, we're in business, he said, taking a firing position and aiming towards the distant hills, where their assailants were taking cover among trees and rocks. Fisher continued to fire suppressive rounds behind them, trying to slow down the militia's advance. How many do you see? Fisher asked. Wallace scanned the hillside, finally spotting a target popping up from behind a rock, firing an assault rifle at them. While it was a scoped rifle, it wasn't the most effective at this distance. He took aim and squeezed the trigger, watching as the round hit the man in the chest, bringing him down. Either he's playing dead or he's down for the count, Wallace reported. Fisher kept up the suppressing fire, even as bullets whizzed past them. We can't stay here, he warned. Wallace quickly scanned the hills and identified several more shooters. I got at least three more in my direction, Wallace informed. We're going to have to risk it. Move, Fisher ordered. The two men left their cover. Fisher firing a few more shots behind them as they sprinted through the river, bullets flying in both directions. Fisher let out a yelp as a round tore through his shoulder from behind. Wallace swiftly turned and aimed his sniper rifle, spotting the shooter emerging from behind the truck. He fired, the bullet finding its mark in the man's throat. Come on, Corporal. You aren't dead yet, Wallace said as he dragged Fisher to the riverbank and onto dry land using a piece of fallen bridge as cover. Wallace set Fisher down, then took cover himself, 
aiming back towards the truck and taunting their assailants. Come on, assholes. Just poke your head around the side. I double dare you. Fisher recovered from the shock of being shot and began firing back, hitting the side of the truck and forcing the militia behind cover. Are you with me, Corporal? Wallace asked. Yeah, I'm here, Wallace, Fisher replied. We gotta move. This is not a good place to be, Wallace urged. Wallace peered over the ridge, noticing an incline to their left that led away from the line of fire of the other militia members. Okay, Fisher, we have a play, but you're going to have to haul ass. You get me, Wallace said. Where are we going? Fisher asked. There's some cover into the hillside, just across the way. Going to be about a 40-yard sprint through open territory. But once we're there, we're golden. Can you make it? Wallace explained. Yeah, just try and keep up, Fisher replied, attempting to lighten the mood. Both men fired in their respective directions to provide cover fire and then sprinted as fast as they could, despite Fisher's pain. Bullets peppered the ground around them as the men in the hills took shots at them. They were relieved when no shots came from behind. They were nearly at their destination when a bullet hit the back of Wallace's leg, causing him to fall face first into the dirt. His rifle skidded away from him. Fisher grabbed him by the back of his shirt and dragged him to cover. Wallace crying out in pain the whole way. Despite his injury, Wallace managed to retrieve his sniper rifle. How bad are you hit? Fisher asked. Wallace looked down and saw a significant chunk of his calf missing. I don't think I'm going to be running a marathon anytime soon, Wallace replied grimly. Don't give up on me yet. I'm going to need your help taking these assholes out, Fisher said. Then let's get up further into these hills. We need cover, Wallace said. Fisher lifted Wallace up with his good arm, and together they found a small path that led into the hilly terrain. The abrupt cessation of gunfire from behind them concerned Fisher, who managed to guide them to cover before collapsing beside Wallace, gasping for breath and enduring the pain. From their concealed position, they had a clear view of the river and their truck, which was now trapped amidst the collapsed bridge wreckage in the shallow waters. They're not getting that out anytime soon, Corporal Fisher remarked, studying the hopeless situation below. Wallace retrieved his rifle, aiming it down at the truck, preparing to fire. Don't fire. They don't care about us anymore, at least not that group, Fisher advised. But they're going for the payload, Wallace argued. They're on foot, and that truck isn't driving out of there. We have time. If you fire now, it may give away our position. The last thing we need right now are their friends coming at us before we're ready, Fisher explained. Wallace reluctantly removed his finger from the firing position, but continued to keep his rifle trained on the truck. What are you doing? Fisher asked. They're working on opening the door. I want to see if Hubbard, you know, Wallace replied. Fisher nodded, and Wallace continued to watch through the scope. It took the militia a few moments, but they managed to pry the door open. Inside the truck, boxes were scattered haphazardly. As they moved the boxes around, one of the men recoiled and drew his gun, aiming it inside the truck. The others calmed him down as they reached inside and pulled out Hubbard's body. It was difficult to discern if he was dead or merely unconscious. But as soon as they placed him in the water, the man who had drawn his handgun fired a shot into Hubbard's head, putting an end to all speculation. The gunshot echoed through the hills, and Wallace dropped his rifle into his lap, tears welling up in his eyes. I was supposed to be in the back of that truck. That was my position. Mine. I. Wallace's voice cracked as he struggled to contain his emotions. Fisher patted him on the shoulder, offering a comforting gesture. I know, Wallace. I know, Fisher said softly. I'm going to make them pay, Fisher. Every last one of them. They're going to pay, Wallace declared, his anger palpable. I know they will, Wallace. We just have to figure out how we're going to do it, Fisher replied, sharing his determination. Fisher scanned the rocky landscape dotted with trees and underbrush from their cover. We need some better cover than this. 
I need you to stay here while I try and find us some. Fisher instructed. Wallace attempted to get up, but the pain in his leg was too much. Fisher pointed his finger at him firmly. Stay here. That's an order, Fisher commanded. Wallace nodded as Fisher got up, shouldering his rifle with his one good arm. He moved cautiously out of their cover, keeping the rifle at hip level. Fisher reached a small bank of trees, taking a knee to assess the terrain. The river was to his right, far below, and a steep rock face to his left was insurmountable. However, straight ahead, there was a cluster of large rocks, each several feet tall. Fisher took a deep breath before venturing towards them. He conducted a quick survey and was relieved to find no enemies in the immediate vicinity. The rocks seemed to provide the best available cover. Better than nothing, I suppose. We should be able to take a few of those assholes out if they come our way, Fisher concluded. Fisher made his way back to Wallace, who was tending to his wound. Wallace had used his belt as a makeshift tourniquet, but it had done little to stem the bleeding. We've got to do something about that bleeding, Fisher said. Any chance you found a medic out there, Wallace quipped, attempting to maintain his sense of humor. Fisher chuckled, wincing slightly as he removed his overshirt. He tossed it to Wallace. You're going to have to tie it off yourself, Fisher instructed. Wallace winced as he secured the tourniquet as tightly as he could. Then Fisher helped him to his feet. Wallace drew his handgun to protect them. You know, when we survive this, you owe me a new shirt, Fisher remarked, trying to keep the atmosphere light. Wallace laughed shaking his head. Bold of you to assume we're surviving this. Cut that out, Wallace. You know damn well we still have a lot of killing left in us, Fisher reassured him. That we do, Corporal. That we do, Wallace agreed. Their resolve unwavering as they prepared to face the battle ahead. Chapter 6 Alvarez led the convoy as it sped down the highway, his eyes constantly shifting between the road and the side mirror. He was keen on keeping an eye on the two pursuing pickup trucks that trailed behind them like relentless shadows. In the driver's seat, he clenched the radio and barked into it, urgency in his voice. Acosta, get up beside me. We need to form a blockade so they don't have a place to hide. Cillian, in another vehicle, responded quickly. Where do you want me? Get up in front of me, Alvarez ordered. If you see an opportunity to break off from us, you do so. I need eyes on the other truck. Copy that, Cillian acknowledged. Alvarez maneuvered his truck to the left lane, allowing Acosta to pull her vehicle up beside him. He stole a glance in the rearview mirror, noticing that the pursuing trucks were closing in, their presence growing more menacing by the second. With determination, he instructed his comrades, Bradley, Leonard, when they get close to us, you unload on them. Private Leonard responded firmly, You can count on it, Sarge. Alvarez exchanged a nod with Acosta, a silent understanding passing between them as they prepared for the impending battle. He tightened his grip on the wheel, a string of curses escaping his lips as the tension mounted. In the back of Alvarez's truck, Private Bradley peered out of a slot, his gaze fixed on the two approaching trucks gaining ground quickly. Two gunners in the rear readied their weapons as the tension soared. Suddenly, bullets pinged off the reinforced door, and Bradley instinctively ducked before thrusting his rifle through the opening. Amidst the hail of incoming fire and his own weapon's roar, aiming became an arduous task. The pursuing trucks maintained a cautious distance, wary of the tail gunners who were ready to unleash hell. Despite their defensive strategy, Several bullets pierced one of the windshields, but miraculously missed their targets. Frustration mounting, Bradley shouted into his radio, They're staying too far back, Sarge. I can't get a good look. Alvarez contemplated a bold move, responding, I can slam on the brakes. Bradley swiftly swapped magazines, chambering around and yelled back, Do it! Alvarez assumed Acosta would follow suit but the message didn't reach her in time. He slammed on the brakes, attempting to repeat the maneuver from a previous chase. This time, however, 
The militia driver was prepared, swiftly veering off the road. The enemy truck sped past Alvarez, gunners in the backfiring shots as they went, miraculously missing their target. The sergeant hit the gas once more, realizing that the truck tailing Acosta's vehicle now had an opening to get beside her. He closed the distance, and the two trucks engaged in a harrowing exchange of gunfire. Bullets tore through the vehicles, shredding them to pieces. Finally, Robertson scored a decisive hit, taking down one of the men in the enemy truck, sending him tumbling over the side and onto the unforgiving pavement. Meanwhile, Cillian raced ahead, recognizing the dire situation. Without regard for his own safety, he aligned himself with the truck closest to Acosta's. In the rearview mirror, he noticed the enemy driver turn toward the ongoing firefight. With a yell, Cillian slammed on the brakes, bracing for impact. The militia truck had no time to react, colliding forcefully with the back of Cillian's vehicle. The impact sent the enemy gunner in the rear flying over both trucks, landing with a brutal thud on the road. Cillian wasted no time and hit the gas, his truck bumping violently over the fallen enemy, ending his threat. Seizing the opportunity, Acosta utilized her larger vehicle to perform a pit maneuver on the smaller pickup, sending it into a wild spin. She accelerated, ramming the front grille into the side of the enemy truck. The enemy driver attempted to shoot at her engine, but his bullets missed as his own tires caught, causing the pickup to flip over and roll on the highway. As the dust settled, Acosta found herself face to face with the other pursuing truck, which opened fire not only on her, but also on Cillian. Robertson tried to provide cover fire, but his shots missed the mark. The gunner in the back of the enemy pickup shifted tactics, aiming at Acosta's front wheels and opening fire. Bullets struck their target, causing the front driver's side wheel to explode. Acosta struggled to maintain control as her truck swerved violently. She had no choice but to slam on the brakes. Alvarez, Seeing the predicament, sped past them, desperately trying to catch up to Cillian. Henderson did his best to aim his rifle out the window using what remained of the side mirror to steady his shots. Though he couldn't hit the enemy gunmen, his gunfire successfully diverted their attention away from Cillian. Both enemy men in the rear turned and unleashed a barrage of bullets toward Alvarez, who'd closed the gap enough to make it difficult for them to target their shots. Meanwhile, the enemy driver in the pickup truck fired relentlessly at Cillian, who hunkered down as far as he could in his seat for protection. Bullets tore through the cab, a relentless onslaught that ripped through the front of the vehicle. The two pickup trucks scraped against each other as the transport truck slammed into the rear of the militia vehicle. All three vehicles were now entwined in a high-stakes road combat. Cillian grabbed the radio, his voice determined and commanding, Sergeant, on the count of three, I want you to slam on the brakes. Alvarez protested, his voice resolute. No, you stop. We will handle it. Just do it, goddammit, Cillian demanded, and be ready to deal with them. Alvarez found himself taken aback by Cillian's commanding tone, but he knew there was no time to waste. He slammed on the brakes, rapidly reducing his speed by half and Cillian mirrored his actions. Cillian veered sharply to the left as he hit the brakes, his truck swerving to the side and clipping the back of the militia vehicle in the process. His truck skidding across the highway, slamming into the rock face at the side of the road, bracing himself. Cillian felt the airbag deploy, cushioning the impact. In contrast, the militia truck spun out of control, its driver forced to slam on the brakes to avoid careening off the road. It ended up sitting horizontally across the highway, vulnerable and exposed. The driver's wide eyes glimpsed Alvarez's approaching vehicle just in time to witness the impending collision. The impact was ferocious. The deafening sound of metal colliding with metal filling the air. The driver met a grisly fate killed instantly as the front grille of Alvarez's truck crushed the cab of the enemy pickup. The two gunmen in the back of the militia truck were thrown from their vehicle, landing hard on the unforgiving pavement. Both men were alive but writhing in pain 
as they struggled to regain their footing. Before they could react, Alvarez sprang out of his truck, racing around the back with his rifle raised, and opened fire. He hit one of the men in the side, sending him crashing to the ground, but the other man managed to return fire. Amidst the exchange of gunfire, Henderson propped his rifle up on the window. His aim compromised, but still determined. He squeezed off a few shots, causing the pavement to erupt around the gunman. Henderson quickly ducked down in the cab, drawing the enemy's fire and creating an opening. Alvarez seized the opportunity, popping out from behind cover and gunning down the remaining militiamen. He approached the two injured men cautiously. His rifle aimed at the first one, who had been shot in the side, reaching out weakly for his weapon lying a few feet away. Alvarez kicked the weapon aside and pointed his rifle at the wounded man's head. How many of you are there? he demanded. The militiaman, bloodied and fading, managed a bloody, toothy smile before slowly succumbing to his fatal wound. Alvarez let out a grunt, kicking the lifeless body aside, his focus shifting to Cillian, who was crawling out of his wrecked pickup truck. Alvarez rushed over to help him, concern etched on his face. Jesus Christ, man, are you okay? Cillian managed a pained but relieved smile. Yeah, not my worst wreck, if you can believe it. It's a good thing we don't have to worry about the deductible, Alvarez quipped, a touch of dark humor amidst the chaos. Both of them shared a nervous laugh, acknowledging the sheer luck that had allowed them to survive the ordeal. That was a hell of a risky move you did back there, Alvarez remarked. Cillian chuckled, still in disbelief. It worked, though. Alvarez agreed. Let's hope we don't have to try it again. I've had my fill of rolling gun battles this week. Cillian, still in pain but determined, glanced at his miraculously intact bike in the truck bed. He winced as he reached for it. Sergeant, can you give me a hand with this? Alvarez nodded as he assisted Cillian in getting the bike to the ground. Without hesitation, Cillian hopped on it, kick-starting the engine to life. He revved it a bit, nodding to Alvarez. We have to get back to Acosta, Cillian stated with urgency. Alvarez reassured him, I'm sure she's fine, but I really need eyes on Fisher and his truck. Okay, I'll let Acosta know that you're on the way, and then I'll head back to the bridge. Cillian replied. We won't be long here, Alvarez confirmed. As Cillian popped a wheelie and raced off towards the bridge, the back of the truck opened up, and Bradley stumbled out with blood streaming down his face. He held his rifle at the ready, preparing to fight until he saw Alvarez. Relieved, Bradley exclaimed, Oh, thank God, I'm seeing double. Alvarez, concerned about Bradley's head wound, inquired, Holy hell! Bradley, are you hit? Just dazed. One of those boxes flew into my head and clocked me, Bradley explained. Alvarez inspected the back of the truck, noticing a significant amount of blood, which heightened his concern. Are you sure you're okay, Bradley? Bradley, with a wry smile, replied, Yeah, head wounds, just bleed like a bitch. Alvarez decided to err on the side of caution. Still, why don't you sit for a few minutes while I check out the truck? Bradley nodded and took a seat on the back of the vehicle, while Alvarez approached the enemy pickup truck with his rifle ready. Upon reaching the driver's side, Alvarez observed the gruesome sight of the enemy driver. His left side essentially merged with the truck's frame. A piece of metal had broken off, piercing through the side of the driver's neck. Alvarez slung his rifle over his shoulder and circled around to the passenger side door struggling momentarily to get it open. He rummaged through the militiamen's belongings, but found only a bag full of ammunition. No explosives or maps. Well, that doesn't help things, Alvarez muttered to himself. Henderson waved him over, and Alvarez jogged to meet him, taking the radio from the private. Sarge, is everybody okay up there? Acosta's voice crackled through the radio. Yeah, Bradley got dinged up, but he'll be fine. What about you? Alvarez replied. Acosta reported Robertson and Leonard are changing the front tire, but other than that, we're fine. How much time do you need? 
Alvarez inquired. Fifteen minutes at the most, Acosta estimated. Okay, get moving as soon as you can. And if you need reinforcements, we'll be ready, Alvarez assured her. Copy that, Sarge, Acosta acknowledged. Alvarez tossed the radio back to Henderson before gazing back at the wreckage of the pickup truck and the lifeless bodies strewn across the road. Despite his best efforts to remain composed, his nerves were beginning to fray under the relentless pressure of their situation. Chapter 7 Fisher and Wallace found themselves nestled behind the protective embrace of rocky outcroppings, trapped between the unscalable steep cliff and a labyrinth of boulders. Both men bore the painful marks of bullets that had pierced their flesh. Wallace, struggling to rise, was supported by Fisher, who used his functional arm to prop him against a smaller boulder. Fisher retrieved a sniper's rifle from the ground and positioned it within Wallace's reach. I appreciate that, mumbled Private Wallace. Corporal Fisher, his wounded arm throbbing with agony, took a knee and set his assault rifle aside to inspect his dwindling ammunition. He sighed in resignation when he realized he was down to a single full magazine. How are you doing on ammo, Wallace? Fisher inquired. Eight more rounds for this, then down to my sidearm, Wallace replied. Fisher attempted to inject some dark humor into the dire situation. Well, look at the bright side, Wallace. Wallace raised an eyebrow. And that is, when the firefight does start, it's going to be a short one. Fisher grinned grimly. Both men shared a morbid laugh, well aware that their chances of survival were hanging by a thread. Wallace focused on the immediate problem at hand, asking, so how do we do this? We have to assume they're hunting us down. Fisher surveyed the treacherous terrain ahead, offering a plan. He pointed to a narrow pathway winding through the rocks. I'm going to go on the hunt, see if I can get a read on their numbers. When they spot me, I'm going to bring them right down that path to give you a clean shot. Just make sure you run by my position. Last thing we need is for them to pin us down here, Wallace advised. Fisher nodded, sealing their agreement with a fist bump. Okay, you sit tight. Hopefully, I won't be too long. Wallace, wincing as he shifted slightly and put pressure on his wounded leg, watched Fisher's departure. He looked down and noticed that the makeshift bandage on his gunshot wound was still bleeding. He let out a sigh before offering himself words of encouragement. Just stay alert, man. You can do this. Fisher had slung his rifle over his shoulder and held his handgun ready in his functional arm. It wasn't his dominant hand. But it was better than nothing. He moved cautiously through the rocky terrain, expecting danger at every turn. Ahead, he spotted a clearing overlooking the river and took cover beside a rock, hoping for a better vantage point. From his position, Fisher observed a trio of men in the distance. One of them scanned the area in his direction, while the other two remained focused on the river and the road that Alvarez had fled down. Fisher's gaze shifted to the transport, where militiamen were unloading and stacking boxes along the riverbank. Pickup trucks on the southern side of the bridge were slowly being loaded with ammunition, but progress was sluggish. Two men struggled to carry heavy crates up the rocky embankment. Fisher muttered to himself, Well, that buys us a little time. Realizing he couldn't reach the men across the clearing for a surprise attack, Fisher shifted his handgun to his wounded arm and placed his rifle atop a rock for stability. He looked through the scope, targeting the militiamen scanning the hill. They saw each other at the same moment, both men pausing when they realized it. They fired their shots simultaneously. Fisher's bullet struck the man just below the neck, above his vest, while the enemy's shot hit Fisher's rifle. The impact knocked the rifle from Fisher's hand and sent shrapnel into his face, including a piece that pierced his eye. He tumbled to the ground, stunned and bleeding. Panic surged through him as bullets from the other two men rained around him, striking trees and rocks. Fisher scrambled to his feet, wiping blood from his good eye to regain his vision. He grabbed his handgun with his functional arm, firing as he retreated, hoping to create distance between himself and the attackers.
Bullets continued to zip around him, narrowly missing him, but the sound of pursuing footsteps filled the air. He halted just before the narrow pathway leading to Wallace's position, waiting for the militiamen to round the corner. As they came into view, Fisher opened fire, forcing them to take cover. He then sprinted down the pathway, passing by Wallace. Fisher slid behind a rock just beyond the entrance, turning to observe the first militiaman descending the pathway. Completely focused on Fisher, the attacker never saw his impending doom. Wallace squeezed the trigger, and a rifle round struck the man's head, obliterating it like a gruesome magic trick. Before Wallace could aim at the second attacker, he had to duck behind cover due to incoming gunfire. Fisher, peering from behind his own cover, aimed his handgun across the way, but failed to make contact, hindered by his offhand and blood streaming into his one good eye. Wallace, despite the pain in his leg, struggled to reposition himself. He steadied the rifle on the rock, targeting the remaining enemy. Wallace watched as the adversary completed his throwing motion before quickly retreating to cover. His heart sank as he heard thud behind him. Turning around, Wallace spotted a hand grenade on the ground, realizing he couldn't escape its blast radius. He fell to the ground, shielding his head as the explosion sent debris flying. Amidst the chaos, Fisher yelled, desperately trying to make contact. Wallace! Fisher yelled. Fisher emptied the remaining rounds from his handgun towards the militiaman's position. A few moments later, the clicks of an empty chamber echoed. As he reached for another magazine on his belt, he heard the militiaman stepping out from behind cover. The militiaman taunted. That was a hell of an effort, especially after that fall from the bridge. But this is where your story ends. Fisher gazed up to see the militiaman raising his rifle in his direction, ready to pull the trigger. Just as despair seemed to grip him, a single shot rang out from the side. The man's head snapped to one side, and he fell to the ground lifeless. Fisher lay there, momentarily stunned, before getting up and hurrying over to the rocks. Wallace! Wallace! He called out, his hopes flickering. Maybe the grenade had landed behind cover. Perhaps Wallace had found refuge. His heart sank as he rounded the boulder. Fisher's eyes widened in horror as he saw the extent of the devastation. Wallace lay on the ground, his legs horribly mangled by the grenade blast. Fisher's arm was filled with shrapnel, and he had lost digits from his hand. Wallace's face was shredded on one side. Desperation and sorrow filled Fisher's voice as he asked, Wallace, my God, what did you do? Wallace, struggling to speak through his injuries, coughed up blood as he replied, I wasn't going to be able to run away from that. Besides, you're the only one of us that has a chance of getting off this rock alive. I wanted to give you that chance. Wallace went into a fit of coughing, blood and agony mixing in his voice. Fisher knelt beside him, helping him roll onto his back. I don't know what to say, Fisher murmured, his emotions welling up. Wallace, his voice barely audible, said, nothing to say. We knew it was a suicide mission. At least I got to take a few of those assholes out with me. Wallace's coughing intensified, and Fisher felt helpless. They both knew that, given their condition, there was no chance of getting to safety. As they sat there, they heard one of the militiamen's radios crackling. Although they couldn't discern the words clearly, the frantic tone of the speaker was unmistakable. You better get a move on. Sounds like they're going to be coming up here soon, Wallace advised. Fisher's concern for Wallace battled with the urgency of their situation. What about you? Wallace, his strength fading, replied with a faint smile. I figure I'll just lay here and enjoy nature for a few minutes. Taking a moment to collect himself, Fisher patted his friend's chest and stood up. He went over to the dead militiaman on the ground and, with a hint of satisfaction, spotted another hand grenade on his vest. We may be out of C4, but I can still take out the stockpile, Fisher muttered to himself. He retrieved the grenade, also grabbing the radio from the militiaman just in time to hear a message. 
Alpha team is non-responsive. Switch to backup channel. Fisher eyed the radio, noticing the keypad with various frequency options. He tossed it aside in frustration, taking the militiamen's assault rifle and two extra magazines. Fisher said to himself, Well, this is one hell of a mess you've got here, Fisher. After a moment to gather himself and wipe away blood and tears, Fisher started moving. He worked his way down the rocky pathway towards the overlook of the river, though progress was slow. Finally, he reached his previous vantage point, scanning the area for a strategic advantage. To his right, he spotted three armed men heading up the path he had taken earlier, the trail of blood serving as an obvious marker. Fisher's thoughts raced as he assessed the situation. We left plenty of blood on the trail. Shouldn't be too hard for them to find our spot. Which puts you on a clock, Fisher, he whispered to himself. Fisher observed the main force. Two men guarding the truck in the river, while four others were unloading crates onto the riverbank. Two more were hauling boxes to their trucks, which were now half-filled. Eight against one, with three more in reserve. I'm down to one eye and barely enough bullets for all of them. Still... I'm not betting against myself, Fisher muttered, a grim smile playing on his lips. With his weapons checked and determination etched on his face, Fisher prepared to engage in a fight he knew he couldn't possibly win. Chapter 8 Cillian raced down the highway, the roar of his dirt bike echoing through the desolate landscape. The adrenaline from the high-speed chase still coursed through his veins but he knew he had to stay focused. As he neared the bridge, he eased off the throttle, not wanting to alert the militia that lay ahead. The opening of the bridge loomed in the distance, and Cillian veered off the road, concealing his bike behind a cluster of rocks. With his bag slung over his shoulder, he began a swift, silent sprint toward the bridge. To his right, a raised ridge offered a commanding view of the entire scene. Climbing the embankment was a struggle, but he eventually gained the high ground. Crouching low, he made his way toward a rocky formation at the edge of the ridge. Nestling himself between two boulders, he retrieved his binoculars from his bag. Through the lenses, he surveyed the situation below. The militia swarmed around the truck, unloading crates of ammunition and ferrying them up the embankment to waiting vehicles. Cillian's hand fumbled through his bag until he found the radio. He dialed it up and spoke into it, his voice cutting through the static. Sergeant, do you copy? A reply came, crackling with interference, but still audible. Cillian, what's your status? I have a good vantage point on the truck, Cillian reported. There's no sign of the team, but the militia is all over the ammo like ants on a dropped ice cream cone. Frustration laced the sergeant's voice as he responded, Damn it. We can't let them get that ammo. I'm going to get a strike force together to come back there. As Alvarez spoke, Cillian continued scanning the area. His binoculars picked out Hubbard's lifeless body, face down in the water. His gaze then fell upon the overlook above the river. Negative, sergeant, Cillian interjected. Alvarez's response carried an edge of annoyance. Excuse me, when did you start giving orders? I'm just being practical, Sergeant, Cillian explained. They have an overwhelming force, and that's just from what I can see. These guys seem to know what they're doing, so it's not a stretch to think they have their positions covered in the hills. As he finished speaking, the hills erupted with gunfire, causing Cillian to instinctively take cover behind the rocks. He cautiously peeked back up, when he realized they weren't firing at him. Still on the radio, Alvarez pressed on, still. We're highly trained and they aren't going to expect us. Cillian interrupted, anxiety creeping into his voice. I hear gunfire coming from the hills. Through his binoculars, he focused on Corporal Fisher, who took cover behind a rock and returned fire towards the woods behind him. It's Corporal Fisher. He's fighting against some of them. Cillian reported. We're on the way, Alvarez affirmed. 
Cillian watched as Fisher abandoned his position and began a perilous descent down the rocky slope toward the river. He winced as Fisher hit the ground hard, stumbling and falling. Looking back up, Cillian spotted three armed men looming above Fisher, aiming their weapons downward. One of them was communicating over a radio. Don't. Sergeant, I beg you, don't. This is a fight you can't win. Fisher just, I think they just took him out, he pleaded desperately. Gunshots erupted, and Cillian's attention snapped to Fisher, who fired back towards the ridge. Alvarez heard the gunfire over the radio, and his tone softened, as if he was heeding Cillian's advice. Who is firing? Is that Wallace or Hubbard? Alvarez inquired. Cillian kept his eyes glued to his binoculars, locking onto Fisher, who managed to get to his feet. He fired back towards the ridge, determined to hold his ground despite his injuries. I don't see Wallace anywhere, but Hubbard is down. I think it was Fisher. He's not looking so good, Sarge. Fisher, in agony, struggled forward, firing with determination. The impact had inflicted severe damage on his legs, with a broken ankle and torn tendons in his knees. Yet, he pressed on, raising his rifle with his good arm and firing. Two guards at the truck and three men on the ridge aimed and fired bullets splashing dangerously close to Fisher. To his surprise, he managed to graze one of the militiamen approaching him, but his comrade returned fire, striking Fisher's upper thigh and forcing him to kneel in the river. Fisher continued firing until his gun clicked empty. In that moment, a round hit him in the back, sending him plunging into the water. He stared longingly at the ammunition, still a hundred yards away. Even if he weren't bleeding out in the river, he had no chance of reaching it with a grenade. With grim determination, Fisher reached for the grenade on his vest, pulling the pin but keeping his hand on the trigger. He discarded his rifle, signaling to the two gunmen approaching him that he was surrendering. Okay, boys, you got me, Fisher called out, his voice laced with resignation. The two men approached Corporal Fisher cautiously, their weapons trained on him. Instead of opening fire immediately, one of them decided to engage in conversation. What's your name, soldier? The militiaman asked. Fisher responded with a wry grin, despite his dire situation. Corporal Fisher, I would ask yours, but I'm terrible with names. If you ask me five minutes from now, I can all but guarantee you won't get an answer out of me. His response elicited a chuckle from both the militiamen and they seemed to relax slightly. I don't suppose you want to tell us where your friend's next stop is? One of them inquired. Fisher shrugged, feigning ignorance. Wish I knew. There was a reason I was driving the rear vehicle. Was never good with directions. Wrong way, Fisher. They'd call me over in the sandbox. As Fisher continued his ramblings, he released the trigger on the grenade, igniting the fuse. I was always getting lost on those streets, Fisher continued, but my men would laugh at me because I'd say the same thing every time. The militiaman raised an eyebrow. And what's that? Fuck it. Let's see what happens, Fisher quipped. With that final statement, Fisher swiftly pulled his hand out from under his body, tossing the live grenade as far as he could towards the two men. They had barely a second to react before the explosive device detonated ending all three of their lives. Cillian sat there in stunned silence, then quickly ducked behind the rock as he realized that everyone would now be scanning the river. He turned down the volume on the radio as he made his escape. Only when he reached his bike did he turn volume up just enough to hear. Sergeant Alvarez, do you copy? He inquired. I'm here. Fisher is gone. They're all gone. Cillian struggled to say. Alvarez's voice came through the radio, devoid of emotion. Get back here, now. I'll be there soon, Cillian replied. Cillian hopped onto his bike, revving it up as he headed back towards the two-truck convoy. It was a somber drive back, with Cillian deeply shaken by the experience. He had witnessed many deaths in recent months, but this was a different kind of horror.
facing armed adversaries. Upon arriving at the convoy, which was finalizing the tire replacement for the truck, Private Robertson reported, We're good to go here, Sarge. But if they shoot out another tire, we're just going to be running short unless we pass a junkyard on the way. Alvarez responded, Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Alvarez looked at Cillian as he pulled up. Surprisingly, the sergeant's stern expression gave way to a moment of understanding as he put an arm around Cillian. Are you okay, Cillian? Alvarez asked. Cillian, still processing the recent events, replied, Yeah, just a little rattled. Fisher went down with a fight, took a couple of them out with him. Alvarez cracked a half-smile and nodded. That sounds like Fisher, all right? Private Leonard interjected. So what's the plan, Sarge? They just hit us hard, and we're going to need gas sooner rather than later. Alvarez motioned for Cillian to join them at the back of the lead truck, where he spread out a map and pointed to the next town, Grangeville. Cillian, I need you to get up the road to Grangeville and scope it out for gas, Alvarez instructed. We're most likely going to bypass it. But if there's gas there, we need to get it. Cillian inquired, Where do you want me to meet you if I can't find anything? A mile outside of town on Route 95, Alvarez answered. Whatever the last building is, we'll be a mile past it. Cillian nodded, preparing to head back to his bike. Alvarez whistled to get his attention. And when Cillian approached, the sergeant handed him a handgun with an extra magazine. Put that in your bag, Alvarez ordered. Cillian, not particularly fond of firearms, complied with the instruction. The rest of the soldiers nodded to him as he walked back to his bike, acknowledging him as one of their own. Cillian kicked his bike to life and sped off towards the town, hoping to find a gas station. The rest of the soldiers stood there, their faces reflecting defeat. Alvarez attempted to boost their morale. I know we just lost three of our own, and they've been hitting us hard, Alvarez said. But we have a mission to see through, and by God, we're going to do it. Now, is everybody with me on that? The soldiers offered a lackluster, yes, Sarge. But Alvarez understood their exhaustion. He continued to rally them. Okay, Bradley. Leonard, you still feeling comfortable in the gunner positions? Private Bradley replied, it's tough as hell to fire out of it. But yeah, I'm good to go. Private Leonard added what he said. Alvarez nodded and ordered, Let's get geared up. We still have a lot of miles to travel, and those guys will be back on our asses before we know it. As the soldiers geared up, Alvarez checked the truck's gas gauge, which read just above a quarter tank. I hope you find something, Cillian. Because if you don't, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Alvarez muttered to himself, aware that their survival depended on it. The end.